ورفع أبويه على العرش وخروا له سجدا وقال يا أبت هذا تأويل رؤياي من قبل هذا تأويل رؤياي من قبل قد جعلها ربي حقا وقد أحسن بي إذ أخرجني من السجن وجاء بكم من البدو من بعد أن نزغ الشيطان بيني وبين إخوتي إن ربي لطيف لما يشاء إنه هو العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على سيد الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته الى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين اما بعد uh, i'd like to start with a bit of an admission today um, there are certain suppositions that I am more convinced of than, um, are, you know, there's difference of opinion among some scholarship on certain issues, and I lean in one direction more than the other, and I'll make that clear as I go. So that's part of the transparency that I try to make public to all of you, um, in that I'm not presenting one view as opposed to all the other views being incorrect, but I do, pres do, I, I do like to let you know that if there is a particular view that I find more convincing, uh, uh, and there are other views out there, and of course, anybody's entitled to look at all of the evidences in front of them and find their own inclination. Uh, but if, having said that, the things that I believe I want to share with you today, I found them extremely profound and very moving. And when that happens, um, let me put this in simple terms, it can be intimidating to talk about. And let me tell you why. So put it simply, you've got your brain, and there's a road that connects your brain to your tongue. You've got something in your mind, you want to say it, right? But your heart is, when your heart feels anxiety or nervousness or fear or over, feels overwhelmed or angry, any emotion that starts surging, then it can create sort of a, a nervousness and it cre create a, a, a barrier between your mind and your tongue and you're not able to speak. So simple example of that is somebody's really stressed out, they're not able to express themselves properly or somebody's very angry, they're at a loss of words. Or as I talked about in the story of Musa alayhi salam, when someone is, um, you know, when Musa alayhi salam gets upset, he naturally has a stutter, but his stutter gets worse. And naturally people that have a stutter, if you accept, if you, if you uh, make them nervous, or you make them upset, then their stutter is going to get worse, right? So I know personally I've experienced that, you know, usually I find myself very capable of expressing myself. But, you know, when I was used to play sports and things like that, and I was the skinniest guy on the basketball court, and I'd get bullied, I'm not able to express myself. I, let me, I find myself at a loss of words and tripping on words. Because when you're in an anxiety-inducing situation, that can happen to your ability to communicate. And some of you are professionally well-spoken. Some of you are attorneys or your professors or, you know, your managers at your company, and you have to, you have to communicate to your team. And you have to communicate or make a case for whatever it is you're going to make a case for. And in general situations, you find yourself very articulate. And in some cases, you find yourself at a loss of words because of the anxiety, which your heart is feeling. So the heart can create a barrier between this, this road, obstacles on this road between the mind and the tongue. And I was reminded because I was thinking about that. Uh, I'm not afraid of the subject. I'm just so moved by it. And I'm so in awe of it, uh, given personally my own bias like I said, that I was reminded of the dua of Musa alayhi salam, one of the closest duas to my heart, uh, dua that I've made you know, countless times when I'm giving a lecture. I've even told you the story about that dua and why I have such a deep connection to it. It's the dua of Musa alayhi salam, Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. And just some things about that. The first thing he asked for is, uh, Allah expand my chest for me. Right, so where does the anxiety come from? It comes from here. And that becomes the barrier to commu communicating. So he identifies the source of the problem and says, expand my chest for me and make my mission easy for me. And then he gets to the point, وَحْلُ الْعُقْتَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي uh, Untie the knot afflicting my tongue. Un undo the knot in my tongue. As if Allah is telling us that all of us, by default, have a knot in our tongue. 
all of us by default are at a loss of words. And it is Allah who undoes that knot every time we open our mouth. And so when we have to communicate something, we want to be, and you know, somebody can say a lot of words and nobody understands what they're saying. That can happen, right? So it's not just, Ya Allah, let me say words that I want to say. Well, the point of the words you want to say is somebody should be able to understand you. So he actually puts the condition, the jawab talab in the ayah, yafqahu qawli, so that they may understand what I'm saying. So they may understand my words. So it's not just that I want to get the words out. I really wish that what's in my mind comes across accurately enough that somebody else gets to appreciate what I have in my head. So sometimes, you know, to put it simply, sometimes you have something really beautiful in your head. And when you talked about it, you did a terrible job. So it just didn't come out right when somebody else heard it. <laughs> you know, when I was younger, I, for better or worse, I watched a lot of Home Improvement. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that show. But in Home Improvement, there's the neighbor, Mr. Wilson, I think his name was. But Tim goes to talk to his neighbor. He's always like half his face over the fence. And he's very wise. And he says these like profound statements and proverbs from like Chinese civilization or the Persians used to say or Rumi said this. Or yeah, he quotes some stuff. And Tim's not really the articulate literary type. So he hears it and he wants to regurgitate it to his wife or his kids when he comes home. And he butchers it completely, right? So you have something in your head. The idea is cool. But the way it comes out is not clear. So I genuinely, uh, I, I wanted to talk about that because I think many of you experience that. But even for myself, as I talk about what I think is so beautiful today, that I pray to Allah that Allah does untie the knot in my tongue. And that my awe of what I'm sharing with you, um, it does not get in the way of me being able to communicate it effectively. So I, I start with that dua. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So we're talking about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam and its, um, its connection to the person who received the story while he was going through a story of his own, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it's not entirely clear when exactly the story was given to him. I know it's popularized that this was in the year that Khadija died and I actually believed that for a long time too. But um, I was talking to Sheikh Suhaib today and I said, let's look at the origin of that popular narration that you know this was in the in the Am al Huzn it's the year of sadness and she has passed and you know things have got, his uncle has passed and many things have become difficult and there's not a clear cut answer to that it's not as clear as the popular narrative makes it what is clear though it's late in Mecca that much is clear so either those terrible events in the prophet's life those devastating events like the death of his beloved wife or the passing of his protective uncle either those things have just happened or they're about to happen, or it's been a little bit of time since they happened. But it's, all of these things are in close proximity to each other, and that is actually not the fundamental point. So even though those things are on the horizon, let's not predicate or let's not make that a dependency on our study of what we're going to learn from in the surah and how we're going to see how it uh, impacts our, our understanding of the Prophet's life sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The other thing that it's, it's really important to say is that each messenger and each prophet is uh, profoundly noble and independent in their own right and deserves a study and, and contemplation of, of what Allah said about them in and of themselves. So it's not like, I don't want you to think, let me put it in the worst case so you understand what I'm getting at that you don't do. I don't want you to think that the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, the point of it is to find parallels to the seerah of the Prophet sallam, Or the point of it is to see connections to the story. Of, it's a story on its own. But as you contemplate it, you will see some things that seem to cor correlate with what happens with the final messenger. So I'm at the end of the day, the author of all of these stories, which actually means the author of the events of all of these lives is the same. It's the, the, the one who's telling us about what happened and the one who designed the events in these individuals' lives. Um, and all the profound events that they went through, it's, the, it's one and the same, it's Allah Himself. Right, so the source is the same. So we'll see some parallels, and we can observe some parallels that I think are, are worthy of notice. And I think it's going to take us more than one session to do that. But the most, I think, um, important in my mind, the most important parallel between what we're reading here and what we see in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is dependent on my view, uh, for myself, on Surat Nasr. The Surah Nasr is one of the shortest surahs in the Quran. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ 
ورأيت الناس يدخلون في دين الله أفواجا فسبح بحمد ربك واستغفره إنه كان توابا um, Not to the highest level of authenticity but there are a number of narrations surrounding that surah that talk about the fact that this was revealed almost at the end of the seerah Hudaybiyah is already done and you know this is around the time of the, 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 the emissaries are starting to accept Islam and all of that and it's at that time that this surah is uh, revealed and one of the most popular narrations um, that substantiates that view, and I'm going to give you a disclaimer, I'm going to disagree with that view respectfully. And there is scholarship that you know, uh, presents a counter-narrative, uh, and one of the leading scholars that presents that counter-narrative is Hamiduddin Farahi, rahimahullah, uh, who I, whose work on this I'm absolutely blown away by. Uh, and I, I studied that maybe over a decade ago, but I still hold that view. And if you listen to my lectures from even more than a decade ago on this surah, I was already convinced of that view. But it was only reinforced by my reading of him. So my old podcast on Juz Amma, if you pull up like Ida Ja'an Rasulullahi wal Fatah, you'll see what I'm talking about. But anyway, I want to read a narration to you that's very popular. So this is this is a time when the Prophet ﷺ has passed, right? And Umar bin al-Khattab is now in leadership. So it's even after the time of Abu Bakr. Umar is in leadership. Ja'a an Abdullah ibn Abbas. So Abdullah ibn Abbas himself, radiallahu anhu, narrates this event. Uh, رضي الله عنهما أن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه سأل أشياخ بدر so عمر رضي الله عنه one day asked the old people the, the senior warriors from the battle of Badr so he gathered the senior warriors of the battle of Badr and was talking to them ما تقولنا في قوله تعالى إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح حتى ختم السورة what do you people say about the surah when the إذا جاء نصر الله والفتح and for those of you who don't know this surah is translated, when the aid of Allah and the victory arrives, you will see people, and you see people um, entering into the religion of Allah in hordes, large groups. Then at that time, declare Allah's perfection, do tasbih, and seek His forgiveness. Wastaghfirhu. He certainly has been someone, He's been the one that accepts repentance continually. And that ayah is in the singular second person, which means it's talking to the Prophet ﷺ. وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ And the Amr Sabih is a singular f- command. سَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ هُ The command وَاسْتَغْفِرْ هُ uh, All of them are the singular, right? So it's talking to Rasul ﷺ. That's the statement. He says, what do you people say about this surah when the help of Allah and the victory arrives? فَقَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ أَمَرَنَا أَنَّ نَحْمُدَ اللَّهَ وَنَسْتَغْفِرَهُ إِذَا نَصَرَنَا وَفَتَحَ عَلَيْنَا That Allah commanded us that we praise Him and seek His forgiveness when He helps us and when He gives us victory. وَسَكَتَ بَعْضُهُمْ And some of them remained quiet. فَلَمْ يَقُلْ شَيْئًا So he didn't say anything. He wasn't satisfied with the answers yet. So Umar asked, what do you think about this ayah? And some sahaba said, well, this ayah is telling us we should be grateful to Allah and we should do istighfar when Allah gives His victory. Quite literally what the surah says. فَقَالَ أَكَذَلِكَ تَقُولُ يَا ابْنَ عَبَّاسِ Is that what you're saying also Ibn Abbas? Ibn Abbas being the foremost student of the Qur'an. So he comes to him رضي الله عنه and says, Is that what your view is too? Uh, قلت, so I said, and Ibn Abbas is the one narrating this story. So he says, I said, لا, uh, No, that's not what I say. ما تقول? What do you say? قلت, هُوَ أَجَلُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَعْلَمَهُ لَهُ It is the time, the time to leave basically. It is the time to leave that has arrived for the Prophet ﷺ that Allah informed him about. فَقَالْ إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ فَذَلِكَ عَلَامَةُ أَجَلِكَ So that is the, the, the sign of your time having come. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ So de- declare Allah's perfection and seek His forgiveness. فَقَالَ عُمْرُ مِنَ الْخَطَّابِ لَا أَعْلَمُ مِنْهَا إِلَّا مَا تَقُولْ I don't know anything about this surah except what you're saying. And let me explain what he means. He's saying that when victory arrives and people have entered into the religion, then Allah is telling Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, your mission is now done. And when your mission is done, you are no longer needed among the people. Your master wants you back. Your owner wants you back. So now that you're done delivering the message, bringing victory to Allah's religion, liberating the Kaaba, and the victory from Allah, the help from Allah has come and the victory has come. Now it's time for you to just do tasbih and istighfar. Now just declare how perfect Allah is and ask His forgiveness because those two things bring you closer and closer to Allah. Now draw, draw closer to Allah and don't worry about people anymore. Don't worry about that mission anymore. It's just you and me now. So <laughs> it's, Ibn Abbas sees this as the 
when this happens, then it's time for you to come back to me. So he, he considers it the farewell address of the Prophet ﷺ. And you can see why so many held the view that this is in fact late, very late in the life of the Prophet ﷺ that this surah is given. The counter view that I'm far more convinced of um, is that this was given to the Prophet ﷺ much sooner. Arguably even in Makkah, this was given to him. The promise of victory, and what he was told was, when this comes, now إِذَا the ظَرْف in the beginning of the ayah, is used for not something that has already happened, it is used for when it is going to happen. The ظَرْف, the word when in English, can be used for the past or the future. So I say, when I ate a sandwich, I felt bloated. When, past tense. But I say, when I eat a sandwich, I'm gonna be happy. That's in the future. I use the identical word when, but that's not how Arabic works. In Arabic, when you, you want to use the word when for the past, you can say hina or inda idhin or lamma, or you can say idh, idh. But when you're going to talk about what's going to happen in the future, you're going to say idha. Idha is idha ja no, It's not idh ja anasullah, it is idha ja anasullah. So it's going to happen. So Ibn Abbas is saying basically not that not it's not a comment on when the surah is revealed, it's a comment on when the reality of this surah manifests. When what this surah is talking about actually happens, then we'll know it's time for the Prophet to go. You understand? And so this is, you know how like hindsight is 2020? This is what Umar bin Khattab is asking about, and he's retro you know, retrospectively asking about this profound surah and what it means. Now, why did I bring up that surah? I thought we were talking about comparing Yusuf and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Let's go a little further. In this surah, there are two terms. The, the aid of Allah, Nasrullah, wal fath and victory. So I'd like you to bear in mind those two terms, the aid of Allah and victory. There's a principle in the Qur'an, Al-Qur'anu yufassiru ba'duhu ba'da. The Qur'an explains and elaborates itself. The Qur'an elaborates itself. When you go to the 40, 48th surah of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Fatih, one of the words of this surah, Nasr and Fatih, it's called Surah Al-Fatih. By the way, this one's called Nasr, that one's called Fatih. Okay, so the two terms, victory and help. And they, this one, help came and then victory, right? Which makes sense, by the way, because if you need victory, first you need Allah's what? Help. So it's in chronological order, the help of Allah came, and thus came the victory. When you open up Surah Al-Fatih, you find, إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ وَيُتِمَّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَيَهْدِيَكَ صِرَاتًا مُسْتَقِيمًا وَيَنْصُرَكَ وَيَنْصُرَكَ اللَّهُ نَصْرًا عَزِيزًا to summarize, no doubt we have given you an obvious, unequivocal victory. Fatih. First ayah. And continuing that same sentence in, through multiple ayat, he says, So that Allah may aid you with a mighty aid. لِيَنْصُرَكَ اللَّهُ نَصْرًا عَزِيزًا So the two terms, Fatih and Nasr, are used in Surah Al-Fatih, in the opening. And the two terms, Nasr and Fatih, are used in Surah Nasr. There has to be a connection between these two surahs. It's not accidental. It's not accidental. What happens in Surah Al-Fatih? Well, it's a commentary on the, the events of Hudaybiyah. That It's a commentary on what happened in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And I won't give you a lecture on Hudaybiyah right now, but I will mention some things that are important for our discussion. You can think of Hudaybiyah, which everybody thought was a loss. All the all the the items on the treaty that we have now signed on to are going against us. But the fact of the matter is, up until now, the Muslims were considered a rebel group. You can consider them a guerrilla group. You can consider them uh, uh, a threat to national security. You can consider them a terrorist organization. You name it. They they're called an, they're outlaws. They're outlaws from all our different tribes. They have no legitimacy. But the fact that the Meccans actually signed a treaty, even if all the clauses of those treaties are going against the Muslims, the fact that they came to the table and negotiated, you know how countries say nowadays we don't negotiate with terrorists? We don't negotiate with criminal groups or gangs? We don't negotiate with the mafia or the cartel, right? So if you have labeled them as criminals or illegals or rebels, then you will not be signing a paper with them. But the fact that you signed a paper with them, what does it do? It legitimizes them in your eyes. 
you have now sent a message across the region that you consider them a legitimate governmental party that you can enter into a tre treaty with. You understand? So for the first time after two wars, uh, uh, three wars actually, Badr, Uhud, and Ahzab, for the first time, the Quraysh are not looking at the Mecca, at Rasul Sallallahu and the Sahaba as criminals, outlaws, rebels, as pe people that have escaped prison or escaped their law system, legal system. None of that. Now they're looking at them as a legitimate ent entity. And because Mecca was the most influential political party in the region, when they signed into this treaty, the entire region, all the tribes are like, wait, the Quraysh? caved and they signed a treaty with Muhammad sallallahu and this too in their own backyard because Rasulullah came to them they should, these are the same people who a year ago went to Medina to kill all the Muslims and now a year later the people you wanted to kill came unarmed at your front door this is the time to kill them but they were so powerless that they had to sign a treaty at that time this shows the rise of legitimacy and power of the Prophet ﷺ and his followers and it shows the decline in the political influence and weakness of the Quraysh and that message was loud and clear to all of the region so tribe after tribe after tribe becomes curious what is so powerful about the Muslims and in that treaty era tribe after tribe representatives of the tribe come in and say hey so because you know we're not warring in this time it's a peace treaty Right? And these tribes come to the Prophet ﷺ and say, So, uh, Islam, huh? Well, I represent, I'm the leader of my tribe. If I accept Islam, my entire tribe accepts Islam. Right? So it's called Amul Wufud. It's called the year of the emissaries. You can call them ambassadors. Tribe leaders would come as ambassadors representing their entire tribe because if the, 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 the tribe leader accepts the religion, everybody accepts the religion. Makkah hasn't been conquered yet. Mecca has not yet been conquered. But people are entering into the religion in huge numbers already, yes or no? They are. And Allah says, and none of this has happened. Only a treaty has been signed so far. I mean, we're looking at history, we see the domino effect. But the Sahaba can't even see it yet. We can see it because it's already all happened. Allah sees it already. <laughs> right? He says, وَأُخْرَى لَمْ تَقْدِرُوا عَلَيْهَا قَدَ حَاتَ اللَّهُ In the same surah, he says, Oh, other land that you haven't even acquired yet, Allah has already encircled it for you. It's no big deal. Secondary. Even conquest is now a secondary issue. It's not a big deal. <laughs> and the whole reason the Prophet ﷺ has gone to Mecca was because he saw a dream that he's going to be making hajj. Right? And at the end of the surah, Allah says, Allah, I did tell you a true dream. We'll come back to that in a second. All of this is going to get tied soon. Tied together. You see, the, that event, that treaty, created a domino effect that guaranteed the conquest of Islam in, in the region. Like, it was the beginning of the end. And you don't have to wait for the last domino to fall, that the last domino will fall. So long as the first domino fell, you already won. Do you understand? So Allah did not wait for everybody to see the last domino falling before He said, I've given you victory. He already said, I've already given you victory. Makkah hasn't even been conquered yet. Sahaba are frustrated that they have to head back to Medina after a, a disadvantageous treaty. And Allah says, what you don't see is what I see. I've dropped the first domino for you. This is happening. And they, where's the help of Allah? You know, usually you think victory will come later. First comes the help of Allah, then comes the victory. That's what I said in Surah Al-Nasr, right? Ida ja'a. Nasrullahi wal fat. First help and then victory. But Allah said something counterintuitive because only Allah could know that in Surah Al Fat. He says, I've already dropped the dominoes that will lead to victory. So that's already done. And by the way, from here on out, all you get is Allah's help. <laughs> all, all you'll see from here on out is Allah's help. So that was the last time Muslims felt disadvantaged. And the, the only thing that happens after that is droves upon droves upon droves of people are coming to accept Islam. And then when some people come in and accept Islam and act like, uh, you know, my entire tribe became Muslim, we should get some special treatment. Allah says, يَمُنُّونَ عَلَيْكَ أَنْ أَسْلَمُوا قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّوا عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّوا عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Oh, they're trying to tell you that did you a favor that they became Muslim? 
No, tell them, don't impose your favor on me with your Islam. In fact, Allah is imposing His favor on you that He guided you to faith. So, the way we're talking about Islam now has changed. It's completely changed. Now, all of this, if I'm arguing that Allah has given a revelation to the Prophet ﷺ much sooner, that victory of Allah, the aid of Allah is coming, and so is the victory, and the fulfillment of that dream has started to happen at the event of what? Hudaybiyah. The ultimate, according to Allah, فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينَ is that, right? So it's the beginning of the end, basically, right? Then what I'm saying is, in Mecca, these Quraysh knew that Islam is not just calling for the worship of one God. The Quran represents a shift in power. It represents a shift in this society. It represents a destruction of the entire economy based on the idols. It represents a destruction of the class society of master and slave, and of superior tribe and inferior race. It represents a complete revolution on the political scale, economic scale, social scale, spiritual. It's not just a spiritual call. It is a radical transformation of that society. And when Allah has promised already that victory is coming, Aid of Allah is coming and victory is coming. Then these Muslims, these fanatical followers of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, believe that they will take over and they will have dominance and they have Allah on their side. Revelation is telling them that they will be victorious and people will enter into their religion. Numbers will be on their side. We need to crush this before it ever gets to that point because it sounds like a crazy thing, but what if it becomes true? So before this gets any further, we need to squash this movement before it even takes hold. You understand? So Islam is not being suppressed. And Rasulullah is not just being suppressed because they don't like the idea of one God. They're in love with their idols. No, they're in love with the economy that comes with those idols. They're in love with the political structure that comes with those idols. And all of that's being threatened by Rasulullah You understand? And because of that, because Allah's, Allah saying Allah's help will come and Allah's deen will be victorious, and the enemies will be destroyed, is really, practically speaking, the Prophet ﷺ having supremacy over them. Allah's supremacy, practically in the world, means what? The Prophet's supremacy over the, over the region. How can we have him in charge? So they try to offer some kind of compromise. Okay, can we keep some of our political power? Can we keep some of our idols? One day your God, one day ours. Can we, what do you, I mean, you want, you want to be governor? We'll make you governor. Join our party, don't make your own. Like stay within the fold, right? So that we don't have to lose our influence. But the point is, the Prophet ﷺ has his own way of doing things. His own way given to him by Allah. He's not going to compromise his mission for anything. Now, if Allah has already revealed to him that victory is coming. And with Fath, victory starts coming. Surah Al-Fath, victory starts coming. Come back to the story of Yusuf. Early on, Yusuf has seen a dream in which the interpretation of that dream basically means that he has a kind of dominance over his brothers. Just as Rasul ﷺ, early revelations are telling, are speaking of a domination that is coming of Rasul ﷺ over his tribal brethren. And his brothers can't stand it. Yusuf's brothers can't stand it. Got to get rid of him somehow. Kill him or at least expel him. Rasul ﷺ, first expelled into a cave, boycotted. And if that doesn't work, attempts to what? Kill him. And he ends up in a foreign place, Medina. Yusuf ends up in a foreign place, Egypt. Allah says he settled him in the land. We settled you in the land. Settled you in the land. Rasul was settled in Medina. He settled him in Medina. And then Allah shows him a dream, of all things, that he's going to make hajj. And the dream of making hajj can only happen in Mecca. And to have to be able to make hajj, you have to have dominance over your enemies who are in charge of Mecca right now. So his dream is one of dominating his brethren in Mecca. You understand that? And in Surah Al-Fat, the surah I said, said the domino effect started. The last part of that surah, surah number 48, is لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ Allah has been true to His Messenger 
in the vision he showed him with truth, with purpose, bil haq. The, the, the messenger's dream that he will be victorious shall come true, and Allah will make it true. So the word for dream is ru'ya, and Allah has given it with purpose, haq. This is the ayah I read to you, Yusuf. Ya abati hada ta'wilu ru'yaya min qabil This is the inter- when his brothers fell in sajda This is the interpretation of my dream from so long ago Qad ja'alaha rabbi haqqa Allah made it haqq My ru'ya became haqq Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa is told in surah al-fath Laqad sadaqa Allahu rasulahu ru'ya bil haqq Allah was true to his messenger when he showed his, his vision and truth <laughs> You will enter. لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ آمِنِينَ You shall enter the sacred masjid by Allah's will safely. Wait, 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 wait. You shall enter the sacred masjid safely, right? Look at the flip. Yusuf Alayhisselam's family came back to him, right? And Rasul is it's a contrast. He's going back to his people. But look at what he says to his family. He says, اُدْخُلُوا مِصْرَ إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ آمِنِينَ Enter Egypt, in, if Allah wills, safely. In, look, listen to the Arabic. Insha'Allahu aminin. لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ Insha'Allahu aminin. You're, you're going to enter the sacred masjid, insha'Allah, safely. <laughs> My mind is blown by Allah promising victory to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by fulfilling his dream. And Rasul, Yusuf السلام, was given a dream. And in that dream, it was a promise of dominance over his brothers, which they couldn't stand. And Rasul السلام, is given revelation, in which he is being promised dominance over the kuffar, and the restoration of the house, and they can't stand it. And at the end of the day, his dream gets fulfilled, and, Ibrahim, and, Rasul, and Yusuf السلام's dream gets fulfilled. <laughs> it's interesting that the word arsh was used in the ayah of Yusuf السلام. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uh, story ends with a, the Arsh greater than the throne greater than any other throne, the liberation of the Kaaba connected to the Arsh of Allah. <laughs> this is so beautiful. It's just so profound. So the two stories are so profoundly interconnected. Just on that note, just 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 how the dreams were. I mean, we're in the first scene, right? The dream. Like he sees a dream. And Rasul Sallallahu sees a dream. That dream means something. And he said, don't tell your brother. What did the father say? Don't tell your brothers this dream because they'll scheme against you, right? فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا Did they scheme against him? Yes. What does Allah say about the Quraysh and what they've been doing to the Prophet? إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدًا وَأَكِيدُوا كَيْدًا They're all making a scheme. No doubt about it. And I'm making my own. <laughs> Same exact words. فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدًا إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدًا Ya Allah. <laughs> it's as if when this surah is being revealed, it's not just the Muslims that are hearing Surah Yusuf. The Quraysh are hearing it too. And the Quraysh are like, is this a commentary about us? Yusuf was told to, stay, to, not, to be worried that his brothers will scheme against him. Because the devil gets them, gets to them, you know. In the shaitan lil insani adu mumin, and Rasul Sallallahu is now reciting this surah, almost telling them, "I am in the place where Yusuf was, and you have been scheming against me, like the brothers of Yusuf. Shaitan's getting to you. The devil's getting to you. And, you know." The, how does the devil get to you? The word in Arabic for when you become tribal, when you become drunk on your group identity, right? I mean, one manifestation of that is racism. Another one of that is nationalism. Another one of that is, you know, extreme tribalism. You, you know what I mean? When people think of their group as superior. It's interesting. A word for that is asabiya in Arabic. Asabiya. And the brothers of Yusuf said, Usba? We are a Usba, a strong band. Who's going to mess with us? So they are, they're drunk on their power as a unit, a group arrogance, if you will. 
Surah Al-Fath, the same surah. إِذْ جَعَلَ فِي قُلُوبِ You know, فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الْحَمِيَةِ No, actually, let me pull up the ayah. The other word for when you bec- your blood starts boiling out of your you know tribal identity in Arabic is hamiya, hamiya. And listen to the word Allah says. Here it is. Is jala aladina kafaru fi qulubihim al hamiyata hamiyata al jahiliyati. When disbelievers placed into their hearts. Um, Group arrogance, the kind of arrogance that belongs in Jahiliya, the kind of arrogance that belongs in the days of ignorance. Is this not a parallel to the brothers of Yusuf who said, <laughs> And he says, while they were becoming ignorant like this, what does Allah say? Allah sent his tranquility onto the believers and to his messenger and onto the believers. And while they were in the worst of their asabiyyah, Yusuf is being thrown in the well and he's being given sakina from Allah. Allah says, you're going to inform him what they did. And they have no idea. Allah calms his heart. So, just as an opening to this discussion about the parallels between the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and the remarkable story of Yusuf ﷺ, the parallels need to be, you know, the, the, in my mind, the, the first parallel really is the promise that was made by way of revelation. Uh, and what that led to, the jealousy that that led to. And the the Qur'an is much stronger revelation than a dream, right? And the Qur'an is much more explicit. And even though Yusuf salam was only given a dream of his dominance, and they never even knew the dream, but still knew that it's coming. They didn't have to hear it for him for them to know that he's... He's going to have some kind of supremacy over us. He's just, dad loves him more. That must be it. Dad's unfair. Right? But clearly they couldn't find something to criticize him on. Right? The same way Rasul Sallallahu is being seen as a threat. And he needs to be removed from the equation. We're going to see two sets of parallels. Um, the brothers of Yusuf Salam, in many ways can be thought of in comparison with the Quraysh. And in other ways, you can also think of the brothers of Yusuf in comparison with the 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 uh, future lineage of the brothers of Yusuf, meaning the Israelites in Medina. So there's two parallels. The brothers of Yusuf could be compared to Quraysh, who are brethren to the Prophet, and the brothers of Yusuf can also be compared to the Israelites in Medina, who are also actually brethren to the Prophet Sallallahu through Ibrahim Alayhi So in both those cases, there is there are these parallels. The final comment I'll make for our first session on this. On the Sirah and Yusuf Ali Salam, is that uh, there is no clear-cut historical record um, that talks about the place of Ibrahim Ali Salam in Meccan society. We know they worshipped idols, but it seems by inference very clear that a lot of their rituals go back to Ibrahim Ali Salam. They were still performing Hajj. They were still sacrificing an animal. They were not unfamiliar with the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the founding of the city being Ismail alayhi salam, some mutated version of that has passed down. Okay, because that the city wouldn't have been inhabited had it not been for Ismail alayhi salam and that entire story. The reason I'm saying that is because they claim to be custodians of the house of their father Ibrahim. Right? That's in a sense that's their claim. They have rights to that because their father founded this house, the Kaaba. That's why it has its value. Rasul Sallallahu is coming and saying, actually you have not been true to the legacy of your father and Allah has, cha- Allah has decided to pass that legacy on to someone who deserves to do right by the house built by their father. Meaning the reg- legacy of Ibrahim Sallam, shall be restored by Rasulullah Sallallahu Right, and really, one way of really uh, reading the seerah is the entire seerah is Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam restoring the legacy of Ibrahim Alayhi Salam for the house that he built. <coughs> that to me is actually a very accurate way of reading the seerah. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, the reason I say that is because from beginning to end, it's about the Kaaba, isn't it? And the entire the culmination of Ibrahim Alayhi Salam's legacy is the Kaaba, so. 
you can see why that's a and, and of course Rasulullah is being told follow the religion of Ibrahim. Millata Ibrahim So there are lots of reasons why we can think that the entire seerah is actually the restoration of his father's legacy, Ibrahim alayhi salam. The reason I bring this up is early on, the brothers of Yusuf are upset that dad loves Yusuf more because Yusuf is closer to the legacy of the father, isn't he? And in a very interesting sense, in a philosophical sense, even in a spiritual, social sense, Ibrahim alayhi salam, they can say that Rasul alayhi salam is more beloved to Ibrahim alayhi salam because he's closer to what the father wants and they want to get rid of that and keep things the way they are. They said about their father, the brother said, Yusuf, brother said about their father, Inna abana lafi mubin, our father is clearly lost. Right? They consider their father lost. Ironically, their father Ibrahim alayhi salam, in, in the case of the Quraysh, their ancient father Ibrahim alayhi salam, considered his ancestors lost and found the right religion. And, and they're the ones that are lost and yet they're considering the call to the return of the father a lost cause. The irony of it, right? So there's this struggle to be true to the father's religion in Yusuf alayhi salam and there's a struggle to be true to the father's religion in the story of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, there's an ayah in the Quran, إِنَّ أَوْلَى النَّاسِ بِإِبْرَاهِيمَ لَلَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ وَهَذَا النَّبِيُّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا The people closest to Ibrahim alayhi salam, the people that have first right to claim a closeness to Ibrahim alayhi salam, are those who followed him, and this prophet, and those who believe. He's closer. So, he is in a sense, you know, أَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ أَبِيهِمْ He's more beloved to their father. <laughs> So there's that beautiful parallel as well. Of course, it's not lost on us that uh, Yusuf salam is making statements in this surah that if you didn't know it was Yusuf making those statements, you would think it's Rasulullah making those statements. So I abai Ibrahima wa Ismaila wa Ishaq. I have followed the religion of my fathers Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq. What does that sound like? إِنِّي تَرَكْتُ مِلَّةَ قَوْمٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِهُمْ كَافِرُونَ I have left a religion of a people who don't believe in Allah and are denial of the afterlife. What does that sound like? You know, uh, you know, and I'm not going to be one to do shirk. Subhanallah, wa ma'ana min al-mushrikeen. And Rasul is saying that at the end. Yusuf is calling to Tawheed. Rasul is calling in the same way and connecting himself to Ibrahim constantly. Just as Rasul is. So these are the parallels that I wanted to, uh, to start with. And the final parallel that I give you, I, I alluded to it a little bit, uh, is that the, the, central, the, the central location in the story of Yusuf salam is Egypt. And Egypt is a very important place in the Quran. It's representative of the mightiest superpower in history that left an imprint on the world and other superpowers wanted to emulate what they accomplished in, in the world, right? And are still fascinated by what they accomplished and how far they got as a civilization in ancient times. And there's still a fascination with how they got to where they got to. And by contrast, these are, these, this is a place that left tombs and treasures and, you know, sophisticated history behind that we want to explore. And by comparison of that entire civilization that spanned millennia, on the flip side, you've got one man who built a house in the middle of the desert with no civilization around. Right? And on the one hand, you've got the ancient pyramids and the sphinx that's been uncovered and all these you know, massive monuments and on the other hand, you've got a construction project made by two people, Ibrahim and Ismail, right? One became the civilizational, worldly aspiration for the world. They want to be like that. They want to accomplish that. There's a pyramid on the dollar bill. They became that. They became the worldly standard of success. And this, the, by, by contrast, the seerah of Rasulullah is in another kind of capital for the world, the spiritual capital of success. So there's a really interesting parallel between these two that you've got on the one hand, and Rasul, when Yusuf rises to prominence, 
What does he have at his disposal? Think about what he has. He has the might of the Egyptian empire at his disposal. He's got their resources, their palaces, their military, their agriculture, their rivers, their, you know, it's powerful stuff. That's what Allah gives Yusuf alayhi salam. What is, what are the palaces and rivers and uh, natural resources and agriculture and, you know, um, infrastructure and international armies and navies that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets? No, 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 he doesn't get that. He gets believers. So you've got material resources, the height of material resources manifest in the story of Yusuf Alayhi victory. And you've got the height of spiritual resources manifest in the, in the conclusion of the Silah. Because the greatest resource, the greatest monument that the Prophet ﷺ leaves behind is the Sahaba, is people. There are no roads. Oh, this was a road built by them, you know. Or, my, or, or towers, or tombs, or <laughs> historical artifacts. Nope. But the thing he left behind is that now, Egypt had an impact on the world, didn't it? It influenced the world. It influenced the world in economic ways, in social ways, in scientific ways, in, in different ways. And the Sahaba impacted the world too in the most profound spiritual ways that the world has ever seen. So you've got the, the how does a transformation in the worldly sense look? And what does a transformation in the spiritual sense look? You've got this interesting contrast between the two stories. It's so profound and beautiful. Last thing I promise, I'm done. Uh, I told you today in the beginning about the difficulty in articulating and I pray that this was of some benefit to you. You know, in the beginning of the series, I talked to you guys about how there are lots of parallels between Musa and Yusuf. Before it slips my mind, I'm going to add one to that list. Yusuf a.s. was given the unusual ability to interpret speech, right? Let's, let me put it in another way. His superpower, granted by Allah, is that he can understand things that other people can't understand. An unnatural ability to what? Understand. To understand. On the flip side, uh, Musa a.s. wants an ability to speak so he may be understood. So Yusuf it has a divinely granted ability to understand, and Musa has a divinely granted ability to be understood. Yafqahu qawli. One of the most powerful debaters in the Quran is Musa a.s. The way that he communicated. And communication is two things. You have to be able to listen and understand what others are saying. And you have to be able to speak in a way that others will understand. And the two sides of communication are the two abilities granted to these two prophets, Yusuf and Musa. Because Yusuf alayhi salam, about internal listening and understanding and analyzing and observing, not even listening, even observing body language, dreams even, right? Ta'wilul ahadith. And on the flip side, a prophet who's given the ability to communicate in a way that others can understand yafqahu qawli, so they may understand what I say. So that's the last parallel that I wanted to share with you today. Inshallah, we'll carry on the conversation about the seerah of our beloved Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and our beloved Yusuf alayhi salam uh, tomorrow and the day after. Uh, probably not tomorrow, because my, my dear Sheikh uh, Yusuf, uh, not Sheikh Yusuf, Sheikh Sahib, who's the, that I'm studying Yusuf with, is, is has some obligations tomorrow, and I wanted to give him a break. So I'll see you guys on Wednesday, inshallah. Barakallahu wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Whew, that was difficult. Ah.